In most ERP experiments, the researchers measure the amplitude or latency of an ERP component in some particular time range and at some particular electrode sites. It turns out that the choice of time range and electrode site can have a big impact on whether the results of the study are replicable or bogus. For example, Felix measured the LPP as the average voltage from 350 to 650 milliseconds at the PZ electrode site. Why did he use this time window and this electrode site? You might think you could just look at the waveforms and scalp distributions and see that this is where the effect is. But it can be dangerous to use what you see in the data to determine how you analyze the data. Here's an example of a simulated experiment that makes this point. In this simulation, I took real data from a single condition in a single group of subjects, and I randomly divided the trials into two sets. I called these two sets of trials condition A and condition B. But the trials were just randomly divided into these two conditions. Any differences between the two conditions in the grand average waveforms you see here are just random differences due to noise in the data. In other words, the null hypothesis is true at every time point in every channel. But if we look at the data before choosing the time windows and electrode sites for analyses, we're bound to find some bogus but significant effects. By bogus, I mean purely a result of noise. I like that term better than type 1 error. It took me years to memorize which kind of error was called type 1 and which one was called type 2 but hopefully it's clear what I mean when I say that an effect was bogus, even though it was statistically significant. You can also think of that as a false positive. When I looked at these waveforms, I saw two differences between conditions A and B that looked pretty big. One was this so-called P1 effect, a more positive voltage for condition B than for condition A across all the right hemisphere electrode sites. The other was this so-called P2 effect, a more positive voltage for condition B at the central and parietal sites in both hemispheres. But remember, these so-called effects just reflect random variation in the data. Conditions A and B were created by just randomly assigning each EEG epoch to one condition or the other. So any significant differences are just bogus. To statistically analyze the data, I looked at the data and used the time windows and electrode sites that looked like they had big effects. I measured the P1 effect from 50 to 150 milliseconds at all electrode sites. I then ran a three-way ANOVA with factors of condition, electrode hemisphere, and anterior to posterior electrode position. The main effect of condition wasn't quite significant, but the condition by hemisphere interaction was significant at P equals 0.011. I measured the P2 effect from 150 to 250 milliseconds at the central and parietal electrode sites. I ran a separate ANOVA on the P2 data, and I found a statistically significant main effect of condition. So, even though there are no true differences between these conditions, I was able to find statistically significant effects. I know these effects are bogus because the two conditions were just different random subsets of the same set of trials. But in a real experiment, it would be hard to know. Why did I find these bogus but significant effects? Well, there are so many time points and electrode sites that you could analyze in an ERP experiment that random variations are bound to cause some fairly large differences somewhere in the data. And if you measure at the time points and electrode sites where you see big differences between conditions, you'll almost always find some statistically significant but completely bogus effects. So when you're reading an ERP paper, you should look at how they decide which time points and electrode sites to analyze. Ideally, the researchers will have chosen their time windows and electrode sites before seeing the data on the basis of prior research. For example, Felix chose to measure the LPP from 350 to 650 milliseconds at the PZ electrode site because that's where other studies have found similar LPP effects. I wrote a paper about this issue several years ago with Nick Gasplin, who was a postdoc in my lab at that time. You can find more information there about how researchers should choose their time windows and electrode sites. This paper makes another point as well which is related to the finding of a significant condition by hemisphere interaction for the P1 wave in this simulated study. Remember, I ran a three-way ANOVA for the P1 wave with factors of condition, electrode hemisphere, and anterior to posterior electrode position. In a three-way ANOVA, you have three main effects, three two-way interactions, and one three-way interaction. So you get seven p-values from one analysis. And this means you now have seven opportunities for noise to create a bogus but significant effect. If you have one p-value and the null hypothesis is true, you'll have a 5% chance of a significant effect. But if you have seven p-values and the null hypothesis is true for all seven of them, then you have about a 30% chance that at least one of them will be significant. 
That's a 30% false positive rate instead of the 5% false positive rate you might expect. Here's what happens to the likelihood of a bogus effect, a false positive, as the number of ANOVA factors increases. If you have a four-way ANOVA, you have over a 50% chance of a bogus but significant effect. And if you have a six-way ANOVA, the odds go up to over 95%. I've included the math here in case you're interested. This is slightly simplified, but it's a close approximation. The problem of inflated false positive rates and multi-factor ANOVAs isn't specific to ERPs. Here's a paper that focuses on the same issue in behavioral research. However, ERP papers often have extra factors that you wouldn't have in a behavioral study, like an anterior to posterior electrode position factor and a left versus right hemisphere factor. This makes the problem more common in ERP studies. There are some straightforward ways to decrease the number of ANOVA factors in ERP studies to avoid this problem. We discuss them in this paper. So remember, you should be cautious when you see ERP analyses with a large number of factors. And you should also be concerned if they don't justify their choice of time windows and electrode sites.